And joining us now is Bashar Dumani. He is a professor of history at the University of California at Berkeley, and he joins us on the line from the Golden Gate State. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Professor. How are you? I'm pretty good. Thank you for inviting me, Steve. Not at all. Well, of course, I want to talk to you about Barack Obama's victory, and I want to find out how enthusiastic you believe Palestinians to, believe, to be that he won the election. Well, Palestinians were very enthusiastic in the same sense that everybody in the world was. Obama mania sort of rolled over uh, the world in one big wave after the election. People are very hopeful that the United States can step back from the Bush policies, uh, standing right there at the brink, and uh, they're glad to see that uh, there may be a new start. There were, of course, false rumors that he was a Muslim that many people observed might have hurt his chances of winning both the nomination and the presidency in the United States. I wonder whether those false rumors may have helped his support, though, uh, among Palestinians. No, not necessarily. I think uh, they understand very well because they're close watchers of the U.S. scene that they can't really hope for much uh, from any U.S. administration. You know, there's only one issue in which Obama and McCain agreed on, uh, and that was uh, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. In fact, uh, they both uh, sort of criticize each other for not supporting Israel enough. So I think that was fairly clear ever since his speech before APAC, which is the pro-Israel lobby in the United States, uh, that uh, he will not break ranks with uh, other U.S. administrations on uh, sort of uh, complete support for Israel on these issues. So I don't think they have any illusions about that. What the Palestinians and many other people in the world, I think, feel uh, is that he is going to be a president that's going to give a chance to a political or diplomatic uh, solutions rather than just rely on military ones. You know, your interpretation of the APEC speech is interesting because I've also talked to very right-wing Israelis slash Jews who point to the same speech and say, aha, you see, we told you, he's not pro-Israel enough. How do you account for this? Yeah, well, for these folks, uh, Obama can't do or say anything that will please them, of course, uh, because uh, uh, these folks are the ones uh, who were very active in the campaign to smear him as a Muslim or as an anti-American, <clears throat> and uh, I think that uh, most of their uh, efforts have been focused on the swing states. So this was a part of a larger infrastructure of smearing, helped uh, no doubt a little bit by the McCain campaign as well in order to change the elections. Uh, so I don't think Obama could have said or done anything that would please a specific group. Let me read you a quote from Jamil Rabah, the Palestinian pollster, who cautions about reading too much into the Palestinian support for Obama, and here's his quote. They like this guy, he says, because he's black, because he's not the typical blue-eyed white Westerner, but they don't know anything about what he stands for. They're investing so much in what they think he promises because he's not George Bush. They see in him what they want to see, but they're setting themselves up for disappointment. Do you agree with that? Oh, if, if they're that naive, yes, they would be setting themselves up for disappointment. You know, when you have a candidate that uh, talks about hope instead of uh, harps on fear, uh, when you have a really a nightmare of the last eight years, people uh, were so eager to get rid of Bush, uh, especially uh, in the rest of the world, uh, that uh, they had a lot of wishful thinking. They put their hopes and substituted them for reality. The reality is that Obama... Um, is a centrist, moderate uh, Democrat. Uh, in the European scale, he would be considered center-right. So um, I don't think that uh, they will have really any illusions about either his position on the Palestinian-Israeli conflict or on uh, fundamental changes in U.S. foreign or domestic policy. There'll be some uh, hopes that Here's a person that gets it. Somehow he understands. Maybe he has to do things for political reasons, but deep down he somehow understands. Unlike Bush, uh, which was not seen as understanding or even relating uh, to the conflict on any level. Okay, but from your perspective, how, is, how important is it for the president-elect to put the Palestinian-Israeli peace process at the top of his Middle East foreign policy priority list? Well, if he does, he will be an exception rather than the rule. Most presidents try to avoid that and deal with it only at a later stage. By then, of course, it's too late uh, for them to have any, make any real difference. I agree with President Carter, who recently said that Obama should uh, move right away, within a month, on uh, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Uh, that will have great symbolic significance because it will probably ease tensions in the Middle East a great deal and uh, will give a, uh, a lot of hope 
uh, that something might happen in the future. It will also help them test the waters. And by the way, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict is not unrelated to uh, the larger issues of Iran, of Afghanistan, of Iraq, of the energy crisis, of the world economy. It's, uh, in fact, a very much uh, a part of all of that. And so if he wants to move on the economy or on Iran, he really needs to move on the Palestinian-Israeli conflict as well. Well, except that that's the gift in politics, as they say, that never, ever, ever gives. And there have been many presidents over the years who have put a lot of their political capital into making some progress on the Palestinian-Israeli issue and have come away at the end of the day frustrated and with absolutely nothing. I'm not pointing fingers here, I'm just stating the obvious. As a res you know, given that, does it really make any sense for him, given the other foreign po policy problems he has in the world, to put the Palestinian problem so front and center in the first month? Well, another way to ask the question is, can he afford not to? So, uh, because this uh, conflict is uh, like a, 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 an albatross around someone's neck. It's always going to be there whether you deal with it <laughs> or not. Um, so, it's, um, it's not something that they can ignore. It's part and parcel of a larger shift in how the United States needs to deal with this entire region. The Palestinian-Israeli conflict cannot be shelved. You did mention Iran a couple of answers ago, and I mm -hmm. wanted to follow up on that because we recently had Yossi Klein Halevi in here, and the, the mm -hmm. former journalist, now a member of an Israeli think tank, uh, had this to say about Iran and the nuclear issue. Roll tape, please. A nuclear Iran is the most apocalyptic scenario that one could imagine. Even if they don't use their nuclear weapon, the very fact that they will have nuclear capability, first of all, will end any possibility of a negotiated peace to the Palestinian conflict. The Palestinians simply will not show up to the table. Hamas will put a veto on it. Uh, other Arab countries will be terrified of crossing Iran. It will mean the end of a negotiated peace in the Middle East. Professor, do you agree with Yossi Klein Halevi's view that a nuclear Iran would make progress on Palestinian-Israeli issues virtually impossible? Uh, no, I don't agree at all. Of course, I do understand why an Israeli doesn't want his country to lose its monopoly on nuclear weapons in the Middle East and not have its way, as it's been used to all these years. Uh, to have, of course, a strong country with a nuclear weapon will put limits on Israeli power in the region, and I can see how that can be very uh, disconcerting uh, for them. Uh, but in f the fact is the biggest obstacle to Palestinian-Israeli conflict has been that the United States and Israel have not uh, agreed with an international consensus uh, on how this uh, sh conflict should be solved, and that, in fact, Israel for the last 40 years has build, been building the infrastructure on the ground through settlements, through the wall, through new roads, etc., that makes a two-state solution impossible. I think uh, that uh, if there is a will, there is a way, and uh, right now Israel has been in such a strong position and had such a uh, unlimited backing from the United States that they haven't had the incentive really to actually make any fundamental changes to their policy. Well, let me just uh, follow up on back. something you said there for a second, because yeah. you, you said the fact is yeah. that the, the Israelis and the Americans haven't followed the quote-unquote international consensus around this issue, and some would mm. observe that, you know, if the United States, given its singular influence around the world these days, is not a party to an international settlement, then in fact there is no consensus. And that's part of the reason why there's no progress. Isn't that fair to say? Uh, not exactly. By international consensus, I meant that uh, for fair-minded observers of the conflict, uh, there's been enormous discussion over 20, 30, 40 years about how to resolve this issue. And I think there's a clear uh, uh, consensus on what the solution is. It's just a matter of time for Israel and the United States to fall into place. In fact. If you've noticed recently, uh, Shimon Peres has signaled his, uh, 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 well, uh, what would be the right word to say, uh, his interest in the Arab peace plan promulgated by Saudi Arabia and the Arab summit uh, not long ago, which encapsulates this international consensus. And if you've also noticed, Ehud Olmert, uh, the former prime minister of Israel, made several dramatic comments uh, a few weeks ago in which he also said that Israel made a mistake by not uh, joining this international consensus and by building the settlements instead. So I think there is awareness inside of Israel uh, of how important it is for them to shift policy on this issue. And hopefully there will be awareness in the United States. In fact, I would argue, if you just let me go on for just one more second, 
uh, that uh, Israel is in many ways more interested in uh, reaching a peace deal with Syria, for example, than the United States under Bush was. The United States government, uh, as you may know, has tried to put a, a, a lock up these uh, um, talks uh, and, and stop them between Israel and Syria because they didn't fit into the larger U.S. plan of what they wanted to do in the region. I don't mean to be, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't mean to be too quarrelsome with you here, but you, you quoted Shimon Peres, who's a former labor politician, and labor is at mm -hmm. a, perhaps an all-time low ebb in Israeli popularity right now. You also quoted Ehud Olmert, who's the outgoing prime minister, who's the most disgraced Israeli prime minister in the country's history. However, be that as it may, let me read a quote here from Barry Rubin, who's the director of research at the Interdisciplinary Center in Herzliya, Israel, about the Israeli view of Obama, and that is, this, my concern, he says, is that the Islamists will see Obama as weak and feel able to do what they want. Iran won't be afraid to develop nuclear weapons, Hezbollah won't be afraid to attack Israel, and Hamas will be the same. What do you think of those concerns? Again, uh, I think uh, they're playing on a certain politics of fear. They have really nothing to do with reality. There is no uh, reason to think that an Obama administration uh, is going to, uh, let's say, collapse when tested by uh, uh, Iran or, or, or someone else, and uh, that the ties between Israel and the United States will somehow fall apart as soon as Obama takes office. Uh, these things are, uh, are not going to happen. Uh, Israel and the United States have a very strong alliance and is getting stronger um, uh, even more with the appointment of, for example, as chief of staff, uh, of Rahm Emanuel, whose father is an Israeli citizen, who himself volunteered to serve in, in, with the Israeli army, uh, and who uh, is a, a very hawkish supporter of Israel. Dennis Ross and many others from the Clinton team who will be joining the Obama team have uh, been like Israel's lawyers in the U.S. government for a very long time. They have a track record. So I, I, don't, I think these uh, fears about Obama somehow, uh, because he, he has a, he's a been accused of being a Muslim or has a middle name of Hussein uh, will somehow uh, be a threat to the future of Israel is unfounded. Let's talk about the upcoming Israeli elections. They're happening in February of 2009. How do Palestinians mm -hmm. view these upcoming elections? Well, uh, they view them with great concern because uh, Israel, of course, is a military occupying power in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip and East Jerusalem. It's a it's also the government uh, has a great deal of effect on what happens to the Palestinian citizens of Israel. So they are very keen to know who will win these elections and what their policies will be. Having said that, uh, th I don't expect there will be any fundamental differences between the candidates when it comes to basic issues uh, such as Jerusalem, such as uh, the settlements. Um, and uh, the wall and, and, and so on. You really think so? Uh, I mean, all three of the, all three of the leaders have been... But sorry, I was just going to say, sorry, you, you, you think... Uh, I, I just wanted to interrupt there because you said y yeah. you, you don't suspect Palestinians see any difference among the three main leaders. And, you know, it, it, it On seemed, the fundamental issues, yes. On the fundamental issues. You don't, you don't think that, the, mm -hmm. that... You think Benjamin Netanyahu and Sipi Livni and, and uh, Ehud Barak have the same position on peace with the Palestinians? Uh, no, they don't have the same positions uh, on peace with the Palestinians, uh, but none of them are willing to remove the five major settlement blocks that Israel has built up in the West Bank, and if these are not removed, there can never be a Palestinian state, for example. Do Palestinians, do you think, have a preference as to who would win that election? Uh, yes, usually uh, uh, they like labor more than Likud, uh, on these issues, uh, and uh, in, in the sense that uh, labor, at least uh, uh, in the past, uh, has tried to strike a somewhat different path, been more open to the possibilities of negotiations and reaching settlement. And in fact, I think that um, Israel has sort of reached, the, in many ways, uh, certain limits of uh, its military power in the sense of what this kind of power can do in terms of political uh, change. Uh, the debacle in Lebanon in 2006 have, I think, convinced many Israeli leaders that negotiations are going to be the only way forward in the future. And therefore, I think that the Israeli government uh, will be, no matter who's elected, will be forced into more of a negotiation posture rather than a military invasion posture. And so I think in that sense, um, 
we can look forward to more serious negotiations regardless of who gets elected in uh, February. Having said that, I can tell you right away that uh, Netanyahu's positions, uh, openly at least, are a lot worse than uh, uh, Livni's positions on some basic aspects of uh, uh, what areas Israel might withdraw from in the West Bank uh, and so on, but not on the fundamental issues of, of the settlements and, and the wall. Let me ask you then about how Palestinians might influence the outcome of this upcoming election. And to start with, I want to read you something that political analyst Hassan Afif El Hassan wrote in the Palestine Chronicle, mm -hmm. and it goes like this. Mm -hmm. The Palestinians should find another path to a just peace without the involvement of the U.S. government. They should focus on dealing with the Israeli people directly, especially the peace camp. The Palestinians have the power to influence the Israeli politics in favor of just peace if they do the right things to encourage the Israeli people to vote for the pro-peace parties rather than the right-wing parties and the ultra-Orthodox factions. Do you have any thoughts on how Palestinians might be able to achieve that influence? Uh, yes, uh, I do. I mean, the most important thing is for Palestinians to clean house. Right now, as you know, uh, the political uh, theater in the Palest for Palestinians is uh, polarized between Hamas and Fatah. Uh, Hamas in, based mostly in Gaza and Fatah and the West Bank. And uh, the reconciliation talks that were supposed to start in Cairo on November 9th were canceled. And this is a very big problem because on January 9th, the uh, President Abbas's term ends and uh, creating a constitutional vacuum. And the parliament cannot step in to fill this vacuum because the Israeli government has uh, went into the Palestinian territories, kidnapped uh, dozens of parliamentarians, put them in prison, many of them belonging to Hamas, who were elected in 2006, and therefore you can't have a quorum and you can't uh, have a functioning parliament either. So we may see in January 9th, uh, by after January 9th, a full-blown political crisis among the Palestinians, and that will uh, make it very difficult for them to be either helpful or hurtful in terms of the Palestinian-Israeli uh, elections. This is one issue. An another is <clears throat> Palestinians who are citizens of Israel, of course, uh, can vote, uh, but they have several parties uh, which don't see eye to eye on, on many issues, so they don't vote as a bloc. I agree that most of them will vote, uh, as they have in the past, for the more liberal uh, Israeli parties as opposed to the more hawkish ones. Uh, and I think that's important that they do so because the right wing in Israel has uh, increased in power uh, a lot in the last generation or so. And um, <clears throat> that does not bode well either for the Israeli people themselves or for the Palestinians. Let me do one follow up on that. In which case, d do you think there is an understanding uh, in Palestinian circles that if there is some kind of, and you fill in the blank here, whatever word is, is appropriate, in Western media they use the word terrorism, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, pick, pick, pick whatever word. I don't want to get bogged down over words there. But if there is a, a terrorist or an incident of violence against Israeli mm -hmm. society in the lead up mm -hmm. to this election in February of 2009, do Palestinian people understand that they will probably therefore get Likud, which is what they don't want? Uh, are you saying you, instead of an October surprise, it would be like a January surprise <laughs> scenario? <clears throat> yes, it's uh, very possible that if there is a, uh, uh, an attack inside of Israel, uh, uh, that this may influence the elections. And in fact, there may be people uh, who are interested in having uh, the more hawkish uh, parties win the elections because they don't feel uh, that they can uh, really have much of a political future if, uh, if there was a, some sort of a meaningful political process. But I really doubt very much that any of the political parties uh, that are uh, effective among Palestinians today have such a scenario in mind. Uh, they realize very much it's against their interest, which is why I think uh, Hamas uh, made a very big deal just recently to uh, uh, go public uh, with the idea of a possibility of a two-state solution in order to basically make it clear to everyone that if something like this happens, it's not because of them. Uh, they are willing to ready sit down and negotiate uh, on that basis. Professor Dumani, I've got a couple of minutes of satellite time left, and sure. I want to cover some domestic Palestinian politics. Starting with mm -hmm. this, uh, we know, of course, there have been constant 
I mean, tensions is really dramatically understating it. There, you know, it's been almost a state of war between Fatah and Hamas. And I'm wondering if you see any potential for reconciliation on that front in the months ahead. Uh, I'm, I'm a bit pessimistic, to tell you the truth. There, there is a tremendous uh, desire uh, among Palestinians everywhere that uh, this kind of inter fighting should stop and there should be a national unity government. Uh, or at least there should be reconciliation talks that resolve these outstanding problems in Fatah and Hamas. Uh, but in spite of that, um, the two sides are not moving in a direction that gives me uh, optimism. Uh, they are partly because there's been an ongoing uh, purge of Hamas going on in the West Bank. Uh, people being arrested, uh, put in jail, uh, institutions dismantled. Uh, a kind of a under the radar war uh, that is very much supported by the United States and Israel uh, who have sent in uh, equipment, who have trained pol uh, Palestinian police, who advise them on how to do this, who work together with the intelligence services to do this. And this has created a great deal of tension inside the West Bank. Of course, uh, many Fatah uh, folks would say that the situation for them in Gaza is not much better. And the point here is that uh, both sides seem to be digging themselves in into two separate geographical entities. And that will make it very difficult for them to reach an agreement if each one eliminates the other in their territory. So I'm not very optimistic on, on that level. Um, and uh, this is uh, very unfortunate, because if the Palestinians can't help themselves, they can't really expect much of the world to, to help them uh, either. By Palestinians here, of course, I, I don't mean Palestinians in the streets, I mean their leadership. So, so both leaderships have a lot to, to answer for, and uh, there needs to be an opening for a different kind of politics among the Palestinians themselves. I hate to leave it on that pessimistic note, but that's our time. Bashar Damani from uh, University of California at Berkeley, thanks so much for joining us on the line. We appreciate your time. Uh, thank you, Steve. <laughs>